Jesus, 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 hallelujah, Jesus, call on your name, Jesus, for whatever we need, Lord, you're the only one we can call on that has all things that we need, we love you, Lord Jesus, we, we've gathered in your name, we've come into your house, we're here to study your word, just us people here, just us little folks right here, Lord, we're just loving on you tonight, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather up together and sing praises, you're so deserving of it, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for being here with us. Lord, we thank you that we've been able to enthrone you on our praises where you belong, on the throne of our life. And so, Lord, now we just want to turn our attention to your word. We, we hold your word in high regard. It is precious. It is true. It is beautiful. It's sweeter than honey, Lord, and we need it for our soul. Our soul is craving your word here tonight, Lord. So, so honor our, our presence with your presence and, and clarity of your word so we could understand who you are better, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody. Everyone doing well? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, hey, listen, uh, we've been having a good time here going through this, this study of 1 John. If there's such, man, whoa, 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 whoa. What's up with this? We need some people. What is this, school? I need some people up here in the amen section. Come on. For real. Like, that's what my man right there, Don. Someone move up. Only people who love Jesus can move to the front, though. For real. Let's get on up here, man. I don't want to be screaming across the room. It's bad enough i got to hold this stupid log in my hand because my mic won't work. Someone move up. Come on now. There we go, Eric. Thank you very much. I see Eric loves me. Thank you very much for coming. Come on, Nancy. Precious one. Thank you, and thanks for doing this thing with the shoe boxes, man. We're, I think we're going to get 75, aren't we? I think we're going to get 75, aren't we? What is this, Sunday morning, y'all? Is this, did I make a wrong turn and end up in the Catholic Church or something? It's all quiet up in here. What's up? We've been going through 1 John. I've enjoyed it so very much. I'm learning a whole lot every time I study this book. Uh, I learn a whole lot. I hope you've learned something along the way. We're kind of getting towards its end. Last week we had a, a great week. I thought we talked a lot about love. Right? We talked a lot about love. And uh, we spent a lot of time talking about love. Actually, actually the last couple of weeks, um, we, we spent time talking about uh, uh, what's normally a feeling, right? Normally it's a feeling, but, but we learned um, in the last couple of weeks that love is actually commanded. Right? And so because it's commanded, it's not just a feeling, it's something you have to choose to do. It's not the result of salvation, it's, it's a choice of a saved person. And, and it's commanded, we're supposed to love God and love his church, there are, it's a command. We also learn that love is the defining mark that you are saved, and that you're a true disciple of Jesus Christ. And the amazing thing about, about love, not just for God, but for people, this, 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 la this, this third thing that we learn about love, this blows me away, that, that, that of all the things in all the universe uh, that could lead someone to Christ, anybody know anybody who needs to, 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 to be uh, led to the Lord? Do you know anybody who needs to get saved? Anybody? 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 Yeah, we all do. And so wouldn't you love to see him get saved? Wouldn't you love to evangelize and just like say just the right word and they would just hear it, they would receive it, and they'd bow on their knee right then and there and give their life to Christ? Like, wouldn't that be awesome? Okay, that's awesome. But here, listen, the great, it says here in the Bible that, the, that, that God's love comes to full expression in the way we love one another. So, so, so we're, we're, the church has been uh, taught to believe that the greatest effort of the church is outreach. And I would beg to differ. I would say that the greatest thing that's going to attract people to the body of Christ is the way we love one another. Not the way you love them. Are we supposed to love them? Well, we're supposed to love them. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Whoever believes, shall, right? I get it. We're supposed to be like But the greatest expression of love in all the universe that's going to attract people to the Savior is the way we in the church love one another. And we all admitted that, that, that not just this church, but all churches, maybe a D, not doing so hot, right? We split over minor doctrinal things. You ticked me off. You took my seat. You took my parking space. Your sermon went too long. The music's too loud. I don't like Hillsong. Get over yourself. That's not love, right? And, and hey, brother, I love you. Just go do it over there in that church, you charismatic freak. I mean, that's what you get, right? You get that. 
And that's not love. And so the greatest attraction to the Savior is the way we love one another. It's the full expression of God's love. It says it in 1 John. We also learn that love grows. Love grows as you abide in close, passionate pursuit of the Lord. The scripture says in 1 John that love grows more perfect. See, you, you, it goes more, it gets more and better and greater and more effective. And you can love people that you couldn't love before. And you can love them in a greater way as you live in God. The longer you're walking with the Lord in close proximity and you're loving him and you're abiding in Christ and you're studying his word and you're praying endlessly, right? Your love becomes more perfect so it grows. These are the things that we learned about love these last couple of weeks. It's Funny, God used John to write these valuable truths about, about the highest of Christian ethic, love. Love is at the center of our name, right? The center of revolution. What's the sudden and momentous shift of the revolution? It's not to draw your weapon like a sword or a gun. Look at the middle of the word. It's the heart of what the church of Jesus Christ is supposed to be. It's the greatest weapon tool of the revolution. What is it? It's love, it's love, it's love. And it's no wonder why God used John, of all the people he could have used, to write to us about love. I'm thinking about John, the author. It wasn't it John who told us, as we live in God, he perfects our love, right? That's what we learned last week. What's, you know, it's really amazing. John's relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ, was so rich and so deep that in John 20, verse 2, this other book of the Bible that this guy John wrote, he actually refers to himself as the one whom Jesus loved. Like, how much does someone have to be loved? How much does he have to feel loved that it actually changes the person's identity. It's not, hey, my name, hey, what's your name? My name's John. No, no, no. It's not what it is. Um, sometimes in the Bible, even not so much in our culture today, but a lot of times in the Bible they'd say like, um, Joshua, son of Nun, right? Um, John and James, son of Zebedee. They would say the person's name and then the dad's name. Like that's their identification mark. But when, when, when John refers to himself, he doesn't say, hey, my name's John. He doesn't say, hey, you're Don. What's your, what's your dad's name? Okay. He didn't say, hi, I'm Don, son of Wayne. He didn't say that. He didn't say um, his vocation. Right. A lot of times that's where identi I identify people, right? What, oh, there's that cop. There's that plumber. There's that crossing guard. There's that teacher. There's the preacher, right? That, that's not what he said. Hey, who are you? Um, I'm the one who Jesus loves. It changed who he was. That was his greatest identification mark, was the one whom Jesus loved. This is who God chose to teach us about love. And as this author is now getting close to the end of his letter, it's a short letter, it's not very long. We, just because I take six months to preach through it, that doesn't mean it's a long letter. It's a short letter, five chapters. You could read it in 15 minutes at most. But as he's getting close to the end of the letter, as the end nears, John starts going into like straight up squirrel mode, like ADD. Like he can't, he can't pay attention to what he's doing. He's like rapid fire. Hey, I need you to know about this. I need you to know about that. And my time's running out. This, 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 this. And before the buzzer sounds, I got to hear, hear all these things. Right? So it doesn't seem to make any sense as to what he's, there's no flow to it at all. So, the next couple of weeks, we're going to highlight and explore some of these, not all of them, because we'll be here for another six months, and I think that although I've enjoyed First John, I hope that you have too, I hope you've learned some stuff, I think it's just kind of at its end. I think it's just time to, to move on to the next thing, right? So what's coming on the horizon is, is a series called I Choose. You know, there's a lot of power in that, right? God said that whatever you choose to obey becomes your master, right? 
Not what's your, what your master is, you have to choose to obey them. No, 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 no. See, that's the way the world works. The, but God's kingdom is different. He said whatever you choose to obey becomes your master. So there's a lot of power that God has given us to choose who and what we're going to do. So we're kind of coming to the end. And so I want you to do me a favor. I want you to open up your Bibles to 1 John chapter 5. I'm going to read the first five verses with you. And I want you to put your eyes on it, okay? Don't just uh, listen to me. I want you to read God's word. We're a Bible church, right? And so, of course, when you come to a Bible church, what are you going to do? You're going to read your Bible, right? The whole idea here, just to let you know, the reason why you're not going to see all the verses up on the screen, just the reference, is because I understand that 80% of Christians don't read their Bible because they're not familiar with it. It's kind of a scary old book that Grandma read, right? And it's dusty, and it's old, and it's big, and it weighs a lot. It's a King James. You don't understand it. Ah, right? So in our church, we want you to get familiar with the Bible enough when you're here so that maybe when you go home, you'll actually pick it up and read it when someone says, hey, I want you to read something from Philemon. You don't think it's a skin disease. It's a book of the Bible. Okay? So open up your Bible to 1 John chapter 5, and let's read the first five verses together. You there? All right, awesome. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, has become a child of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his children too. We know who loved, I'm sorry, we know we love God's children if we love God and obey his commandments. Loving God means keeping his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. We all think that maybe God's rules are strict and he's the cosmic fun sucker in the sky, right? Some people think that. But I would just tell you that they're, uh, the word of God says that they're not burdensome. And for those of us that are really trying to keep them, we realize that they're really not as burdensome as we once thought. Verse 4, for every child of God defeats this evil world and we achieve this victory through our faith. And who can win this battle against the world? Who can? Well, only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So here's the question. It says, everyone who believes. Everyone who believes. So, like, what does that mean? See, I'm, I'm one to say that when the Bible says something, it just is, it is written. So we just believe it for what it says, right? Everyone who believes. Well, sometimes when you study the Bible, you have to realize that what you just think off the cuff isn't exactly what it means. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. You've got to take everyone who believes, you've got to figure out all the different ways that could be understood. Because on the surface level, everyone who believes, we just say, well, okay, well, if you believe that Jesus is the Christ and he's the Messiah, and he's, then, then you're good, you're saved. And, because that's kind of what it says, right? Everyone who believes, right, is a child of God. But I want to remind you of, um, of a story in Mark chapter 5. So in Ma Mark chapter 5, Jesus gets into a boat with his disciples, and he goes across the boat because he was going to go over to this one area. And over in this area, on the other side of the lake, is this crazy guy, and he's, he's, he lives in a cemetery, and, and, he, he, and they can't contain him. Like, he's so powerful that he breaks through the chains that are shackling him, and he runs around this, the cemetery at night, howling at the moon like a crazy nut job, and screaming and yelling and scaring everybody in town. And so Jesus, this is awesome, right? Jesus gets into a boat with his disciples. Let's, let's go over there, right? He, 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 ministry's dirty, y'all. Ministry's grimy. Ministry's hard, right? And Jesus goes right after, and it's amazing. when he, I'm going to tell you the story, but when the story's over, guess what Jesus does? Gets back in the boat, goes back to the other side. Think about that. The one thing he did was go all the way across the lake just to meet that one dude that none of us want to talk to. That's Jesus Christ the Lord. That should teach us something, okay? So anyway, so he goes over there. This guy's crazy. And he's cutting himself with rock. I mean, just nuts, right? And, and, and so Jesus comes in the boat over to that side of the lake. And when he gets there, right, this, that dude comes running up, running up to him. And he bows before Jesus. Now, it's not this guy. Because when the, when, when the guy opens his mouth, he's not saying, hey, my name's Eric. My name's Moses. My name's John. He's like, my name's Legion. What? Yeah, there's a bunch of us in here. 
So this guy is not even w working under his own power, right? He, so so, so this, this group of demons who's possessing and, in, and instructing this human body what to do runs up to Jesus, bows down before him, and says, Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? You bet your bottom dollar that, that those demons, they, they knew who Jesus was, right? They know Jesus better than some of us know Jesus. They bowed down before him and said, well, you're the son of the most high God. See, demons understand and believe who Jesus is, but clearly they're not children of God, right? So, so it just can't mean everyone who believes that he is who he is is a child of God. It can't mean that. And that's why we carefully study the whole of Scripture. Because if you just rip your Bible open one day and read that, you're going to believe that anyone who believes it, they're a Christian. And I'm not into that easy believism. Okay? Jesus said that the, that the, that the gate is narrow and the, and the road is difficult and only a very few find it. There's nothing easy about that. Okay? So don't just think because every, it says everyone who believes is. Okay? Here's what I think. Listen, here's the scripture, and here's me. So I'm not saying this is, but I started thinking about what are all the different things that everyone who believes could mean, right? Kind of like we had a funeral here today, and they're talking about being absent from the body means to be present with the Lord. I'm not going to tell you how to think, but let me ask you a question. Where does it say that the moment you're absent from the body, you're present with the Lord? Does it say that in the verse? No, but we assume it. I'm just saying sometimes you need to think about what you read and don't draw a quick conclusion. Base it on the whole of Scripture. That's why we read and study God's Word and meditate on it so we can rightly divide what it says because you're making decisions that are going to impact your eternity. They matter. So it matters to, to read and study. So this is just what I believe about it. Everyone who believes. I believe that there's a lot of generational a lot of ancestral, and a lot of, I'll call it, playground faiths. And what do I mean by that? I mean, well, are you a Christian? Well, you know what, my mom, man, she was such a godly woman. And she was in church all the time. And my dad, man, he taught Sunday school. And my grandpa, he was a preacher for 475 years. And we went to Sunday school every single week. And yeah, my, my parents baptized me. And I come from a long line of Baptist, yada, yada, whatever, right? I was that kind of Jew. So I know what I'm speaking of. I was that kind of Jew. See, if someone asked me, are you Jewish? I would say, yes. Of course, I'm not, listen, I, I would say that um, somewhere along the line in my family tree, there was probably one or two or many that were actually devout Jewish folks. They, like, they went to temple, they read the Torah, they prayed all the time, they observed the festivals and the feasts, like they did it, right? But, but for me, I, I wasn't doing that in any way, ever. It was a hand-me-down faith, right? So, so you know, uh, they were, right? So I am, right? Hey, my uncle used to play for the Red Sox, so that means I'm on the team, right? Isn't that the way it works? No, you got to make, you got to get your own tryout, right? You got to make the team yourself. And, and that was the problem with me, and there's a lot of that going on. I call it playground faith, Um <laughs> Remember when you were kids, if you guys can remember back that far, I'm having a hard time with that lately. But, but, but when, 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 when you were a kid, remember when you played tag in the playground? Anyone ever play tag? You want to play tag? You're it. Why aren't you coming to get me, bro? Where's base? Where's base? Mimi's base. Mimi's base. Here, touch her. Mimi's base. Come get me. Electricity. You can't get me. Sit down. No, 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 no. Electricity. 
Right? You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Electricity? You're right. You're right. You're right. Yeah. I didn't know either. I had it in my notes. It didn't say do it. But that's, that's the way people think about faith, right? Well, you know, they, she and my mom and my dad and my friends and my uncle, my, and, and they were so, right? No, 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 no. True faith in God is personal. And God, God doesn't allow for electricity, right? You got to get on base yourself. You got to get on base yourself, okay? Now, that's my fun little illustration, but do me a favor. Go to, Ma- go to the book of Matthew, chapter 16. Look at Matthew 16. Here's a, so mine's a cute little funny game and everything, but here's, here's, where, here's, the, here's the real deal. Biblical. Um, I don't want to just say something and make a joke and, and go, oh, that guy's funny. That's, that doesn't matter. Matthew 16, verses 13 through 16. Here, here's what happens. Jesus is roaming around with his guys, right? And he says to him, he says, hey, listen, uh, who, do you, who do they say that I am? Right? Who do they say that I am? Like, who, who do you think Jesus is? And who do you think Jesus is? And who do they, who's that, what about this guy? What, are they, what, are they, what does this section over here think of Jesus? What do, they, what do they say about him? And so, of course, you know, the answer, well, you know, some people think that you're this prophet and John the Baptist and Elijah and all these different things. And they have their opinion, right? That's all. What if those people were right? That'd be good. But Jesus isn't satisfied with that because there's no electricity in the kingdom of God, right? you got to get on base yourself. And he looks at Peter and goes, yeah, but who do you say that I am? Because it doesn't make any difference who, if they're on base, praise God for that. But you got to get on base, right? So who do you say that I am? That's the question. And we all have to make that decision up ourselves. Everyone who believes. That means it's an individual thing. You have to make this decision up for yourself. Don't rely on the baptism of your mom and dad when you were so young you don't even remember it. It doesn't mean anything, okay? It's a decision of your will that you make to get on base yourself. See, when you acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, then and only then are you a child of God, okay? You can't be saved without your own personal decision. There's no electricity. There's no electricity in the kingdom of God, okay? You got that? You got that. You got that. Clarity? All right, so John, I told you before, rapid fire all over the place. He immediately moves from belief You'll see it back in the text. Let's just go back there. He goes from belief, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Messiah has become a child of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves this. Like, what, what happened there? This is like this massive, like, just right from belief to love. From belief to love. Almost as if, and I don't know, but almost seems as if they're kind of used interchangeably. They're kind of one and the same. It seems to me, as I read it, that real belief in God, real belief, not demonic belief like Legion had, but real Christian authentic love is the same as real authentic belief in Jesus. They go hand in hand. And that's kind of a weird thing for us as people to understand or embrace because normally love is something that is... um, it's earned and realized over time. It takes time for, for you to realize that someone loves you, right? Because you're spending time with them and having experiences with them. And then as the, the, the experiences and time move on, then it's shown as a result of that, right? And so, so you're hanging out with someone. Like, not at first. You're like, like oh, I love you. I just met four minutes ago. Like, that doesn't happen. It usually doesn't end well. But, but as, you, as you start hanging out with them and experiencing some things with them, all of a sudden, like, this weird kind of funny feeling starts happening, right? You're like, yeah, I'm kind of feeling some things here, man, and I just want to start 
doing things for this person, and I don't don't even know why I want to do that. But I'm not going to say I love you first, because if I say I love you first, I lose. You have to say I love you first, right? But it's what happens. We we start having these experiences with people, and over time, we start to to love them, right? But first of all, remember, love for God and love for people, that's different. See, that's the way we normally interact with people. But it's totally different. John says love for God isn't like that at all. It's not the same as love for your kids. It's not the same for, as love for your team, love for your job, love for your nation, love for your sister, love for your brother. Love for God is way different. It's way different. Let's play a little fun game. You guys want to play a game in church? Yeah, let's, play a, let's play a fun game. I want you to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name some things, and I want you to, we're going to play um, uh, I Love Meredith, okay? I love my wife. I love my wife. Love my wife. I'm totally in love with my wife. She is the best. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just ask you a couple things. We'll put them up there on the on the screen. I think they should be up there. Um, I'm gonna say something, and you tell me if this is a way to express my love for Meredith. Okay, um, to to verbalize it and say, Meredith, I love you. Is that one? Give me a thumbs up or thumb down. Does that sum up? That's that's a good way to express. Right? You gotta tell her once in a while. You gotta tell your spouse that you love them. Right? They like to hear it once in a while. Okay, you guys. That's free. Okay, so that was definitely loving Meredith, that one right there. How, how about this one? Man, I just, I just love you so much that I'm, I, I, I want to go buy you a gift. I want to I take you on a ride on the motorcycle. We're going to go get ice cream. Um, I notice what you do around the house, so I'm going to go, and I'm going to go uh, do the dishes that you normally do, and I'm going to do the laundry that you normally do, and I'm going to vac. It sounds like she does everything, right? Because she does. And, and if, but if I do those things for Meredith, is that an expression of love? Towards who? Towards Meredith, right? Awesome. How about this? Um, anybody in here hurt? Physically hurt? Okay, awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, here, here's, here's the deal. So, so, so she, she, I'll just say this. Um, Karen, I know this of Karen, she is allergic to cut grass. Okay. So let me ask you a question. If, if I go over and cut her lawn because she's allergic to grass, is that my way of expressing my love for Meredith? Okay. No. Um, how about this? How about, um, just picking on you. You know I love you, right? So did you guys know that, that John lied to me the other day? Did you guys know that? He lied like a rug to me. <laughs> Pretty bad. It was actually quite bad. I'm just kidding. Illustration purposes only. So, so what if I, is it, a, is it a show of love to my wife? If I go to John and I say, hey, John, you know, uh, I know that you lied to me. You know, I, I get it. But you know what? I just forgive you. And, and I just look back at what Jesus did for me because I let him down so badly. He forgave me. And I just want to let you know that the debt you owe me for what you did, like, done free and clear I, i'm not going to hold a grudge anymore i'm not going to think about it anymore when i do i'm going to just forgive you again i'm not going to mention it to you anymore i'm not going to dwell on it anymore i'm forgiving you it's done okay awesome is that my way of loving who my loving meredith okay so loving listen loving meredith you just you, you i think you guys did a pretty good job on that okay but loving god that is loving god Okay? See, because loving God says that I'm to love his people, his church, his other Christians, right? So, right? And I'm to obey his commands. And I, so loving Meredith, I, I, <laughs> listen, I, loving Meredith never means I have to obey her commands. Okay? Loving my children never means I have to obey their commands. Okay? Loving, lo- loving my wife never meant that I have to go cut Karen's grass. Okay? But loving God means all those things. Okay? So it's a totally different thing. For when you love God, you love his church. And how many, how many members of God's church does that mean? All of them, right? The ones you don't like the ones who cut you off in the parking lot, the ones who are more uh, enthusiastic in church, and why is he always standing up in front of me and I can't see over his hands? And all those people, right, the ones that don't sit up, stand up and you don't understand why they don't sit up, and everyone in the church is supposed to love, okay? All of them. Now listen, 
This is nothing new in our careful study of 1 John. It's just a reminder yet again. It's the same thing that he told us in John, uh, 1 John chapter 2. You can look there real quick, verse 3 through 5. He says, and we can be sure, which is why he wrote this letter. He wrote this letter to believers so that they could be sure that they're saved. Right? He says, and we can be sure, believer, that we know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims, I know God, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. Some people over the years have told me that there's a difference between his laws and his commands and his word. And let me just read this here. We can be sure that we know him if we obey his commands. If someone claims I know God but doesn't obey God's commands, commandments, that's a little different. Same thing, though. That person is a liar, not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word, one and the same. One and the same. Command, word, command, word, one and the same, one and the same. They, they, they go hand in hand. There's no difference between the two. If you don't obey God's word, you, 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 you're a liar. You're not living in the truth. Who's the truth? Jesus. You're not living in Jesus. Uh, but those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. So did you see what happened there too? Did you see what happened there? Again, he went, a moment ago, he went from belief to love. He went from commandment to, to word, and then here again, he did it again. He, he made two things into one thing. He, he said, if, if you um, know him, then you love him. If you know him, that means you love him. And that means you keep his commands. And that means you love all Christians. They're all the same thing. To know him is to love him. To love him is to keep his commandments. To keep his commandments is to love all Christians. Let me ask you a question. Is keeping God's commands perfectly, does it save you? Verse 4. Verse 4 of our text. Go back there. Loving God means keeping his commandments, for sure, and commandments are not burdensome. For every child of God defeats this evil world, and we achieve this victory through keeping the commands? No. Through our faith. Through our faith. So the answer is clearly no. Victory is by faith in Christ alone. Not by keeping his commandments, but somehow in the church, what's happened is some churches go faith and some churches go commands right but what i want to tell you what i want to offer up for suggestion is that it's both see once you've been saved by faith in christ you must keep his commands for this is how we know that we love him and are living in him you can't have one without the other so i would just say this as your pastor as a suggestion as a warning uh, don't listen to those who are hammering grace, 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 grace to the exclusion of following God's commands. It's both. They're married. You can't separate them. Loving God means keeping his commands, right? Keeping his commands. Okay. Um, let's, can we read on in the text? I mean, are we good? Clarity, clarity, clarity. Okay, awesome. Um, let's read 6 through 12 now. Can we do that? Let's just jump to the next thing. So 6 through 12. Um, and Jesus was revealed as God's son by his baptism in water and by shedding his blood on the cross, not by water only, but by water and the blood. And the spirit who is truth. Do you see that there too? Do you see how he did that? What did you guys say a minute ago? Who's the truth? You said Jesus, but what does it say here? The spirit is truth because they're one and the same, but yet they're two different things. Awesome. I don't even understand that, but it's so cool. And the spirit who is truth, can I love being dumb. I love being dumb. People are like, can you explain your faith? No, I just believe it. Okay, totally closed-minded, happy Christian. 
All right, so he says, uh, and the spirit who is truth confirms it with his testimony. So there's the blood, there's the water, and the spirit confirms their testimony with his testimony. So we have these three witnesses, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and all three agree. Since we believe human testimony, surely we can believe the greater testimony that comes from God. And God has testified about his son. All who believe in the Son of God know in their hearts that this testimony is true. Those who don't believe this are actually calling God a liar. Don't do that. Because they don't believe what God has testified about his Son. And this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. Okay, so um, John takes this hard turn from all this other stuff he was talking about, about loving God and loving the church, and he just, bam, just goes totally into this Trinity lesson, right? And it seems kind of random, but I, I... you know, careful study and meditation, I, I realize that it's not random at, at all, as a matter of fact. And, and um, I was reminded when I was meditating on this of, of, of the Apostle Paul in, in 1 Corinthians when he says, um, you know, when I came to you, like, you guys realize, you, you, you know, Paul knows a lot about God, right? And we use his teaching to, to learn, and I, I don't come up with anything new on my own because he's, he's got it down. I'm just trying to tell you what he said, you know. So, so, so um, he says to the church in Corinth, he's like, yeah, but you know, like when I came to you, I, I could have taught you about this and this and this and this, but I just, this is what I did. I just teach you about Jesus Christ, and, and he got crucified for you. And then the next time he went to the temple and he preached again. Um, so there's this guy, Jesus Christ, and he got crucified for you. And then, then the next day when he came back, just guess what he preached about. Jesus Christ and he got crucified for you like like he didn't come up with anything new. he said when I came there I did I just came and I, I I forgot all things except this right all things except this thing and so um, we have to keep preaching what matters most because we're so prone to let go of what matters most right that's you know ever notice why there's four gospels and like three of them say the same thing and it, is it because because God said man I Luke, I didn't know that you were going to write that, so I told Matthew to do it too. And then, oh, and then Mark, he did the same. Man, I don't know. What to say. Well, at least John, you got it right. You wrote your own thing. That's not what happened, right? He, he, he said, he, he's repeating stuff. Why? Because we forget stuff. And so because we're prone to forget the most important things, that's why Paul said, I'm going to just preach the most important thing. Jesus Christ, and he got crucified for you. That's what he preached over and over and over again. And so when you see what, what John's doing here, it starts to make sense. Like, why does he go to this whole Trinity thing all the time? Listen to this. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.1, he says this. The Holy Spirit tells us clearly. Now, i got to pause there for a second. So if the Holy Spirit of God is about to say something, true, should we take it lightly? It's really important. It's totally accurate, 100%, right? So he's about to say something, what the Holy Spirit is telling us. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, tells us clearly, like no doubt, that in the last days, some will turn away, some will depart, some will abandon the true faith. They will leave. Now listen up, listen. You cannot possibly depart from a place you never were. You can't possibly abandon someone that you never embraced. I'm not a once saved, always saved guy. And before you go storming the doors, you can, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit of God says that in the last days that people will abandon depart and turn from the faith. If you 
say, well, they were never saved. Okay, so let's just say, and I know you're not, let's just say you're lost. You're in the lost section over here, right? He's lost. Help me, help me, help me, help me. If he never gets here, are you going to tell me that he turned away from the faith? No, he was never here. This is what's taught. Just take the word of God for what it says. Many will turn away. That means they were there. Some will abandon, depart. That means they were there. You can't leave this building if you never came. Right? It doesn't take a brain surgeon to figure this out. And so that's why... John is hammering this truth about the triune nature of God. You have to never, ever let that go. This is at the basic foundation of the faith. And there are churches and religions out there trying to teach you that somehow Jesus Christ is not deity. When the whole time the Father and the Spirit both testify to the deity of Jesus Christ the Son. Right? The fullness of deity was pleased to dwell in the person of Jesus Christ. That's who he is. And so you see here, he talks about this. He was revealed as God's son. See, there's no question. Nobody ever questions that there's a God. Like the whole Father God thing, never a problem. People just have no problem with that. Spirit of God, well, he can't really prove that guy. He's just a, you know, some weird ghost, so we'll just let that one slide. But this Jesus guy, he was right here, and I didn't really like him, and so you, I don't really know about that. He's just a dude. Isn't that just Joseph's kid? So that's why it's not spending a whole lot of time here trying to prove the existence of the Father. Or prove the existence or the deity of the Spirit. The assumption is there. That the Father and the Spirit are God. So there's no arguing that. We get it. But what are they both doing? They're testifying to the deity of the Son, Jesus Christ. And you've got to get this and hold on to it forever. And, and, and listen, you should never get tired of coming to church to hear about Jesus. Never. Never. If you are, this is not your church. Okay? So he talks about the baptism in the water. You know, the baptism when Jesus came down to the Jordan River and John the Baptist points to him and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So this is the testimony of the Spirit. Look what happens. He's coming up out of the water and then, right, right? Like what? In the, it says like a dove. So, so I was thinking about that today too. Like um, it wasn't really a dove. You know that, right? It was like a dove. Like what did they see? I wonder, but they saw something, right? Because they saw something. I don't even know if it was like a, maybe it was just, maybe it just came down in the, in the you never see a, a dove land on your roof? And it's going like really fast, and all of a sudden it just kind of slows down and hovers and goes, and, and just goes down on the, you know what I'm talking about? Am I the only one? So may, maybe they just saw something, I don't know, I was thinking about maybe a, you know, like, I don't know. I don't, it wasn't a dove. At least, but they saw some. These, they saw something, right? Something happened. And this thing, <coughs> this being, this spirit. How, you see a spirit. That's like so amazing, right? And, they, and this spirit went. <laughs> and landed on Jesus. And then, if that's not enough. Now the Father, the Sovereign One. So they saw something, and then they heard a voice come down from heaven saying, that is my, I'm trying to give it my best like Morgan Freeman, right? <laughs> that is my dearly beloved Son, whoo, who brings me great joy, right? So, so there's, there's the testimony of the water, like what happened there, and then the blood. Let me walk you through the scriptures. Can we do that? Just a short walk, just a short path. It's not a long one. We'll start right here, Hebrews 9.22. It says, for without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Wait a minute. Hold on a second here. thought maybe that was some blood in there. Where's your blood? Where's your, where's your blood? 
You guys didn't bring your blood with you? Wait a minute, hold on a sec. Why would you come to church and, and pray and ask for forgiveness and, and save me? Well, you got no blood with you. Where's your blood? You didn't bring any blood. Where's your blood, people? Where's your blood with you? You didn't bring any blood? What's wrong with you people? You can't ask for forgiveness and get it without any blood. What are you doing? You got no blood with you, right? You got no blood. No, you don't. I, I want to see your own blood. Where's your blood? You don't have any. You didn't bring your blood with you, right? You didn't come to the altar and, 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 and pray and ask God for forgiveness without any blood, right? Don't you don't just say I'm sorry and forgive me. You ain't got no blood with you. Why do you come to church with no blood? Let me tell you why. Romans 3.25 says, For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrifices life, shedding his blood. There's your blood. Right? There's your blood. There's your blood. It's, you can't ask forgiveness without the shedding of blood. Right? So you didn't bring your blood. I don't see anyone dragging any goats up in here tonight. Right? So you got to bring some blood. And Jesus is like, I'll give you the blood. So when you come to the Lord and you say, please forgive me, here's Jesus' blood, Daddy. And he's like, I'll take that. He, that's a good place for his amen. He'll say amen. To, he'll say, yes, yeah, sure, no problem. You didn't have your own blood. Hebrews 9, 14. Just think how much the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. The water the blood, the spirit, and then the father speaking at the water. And then further testimony of the father. We see it there in verse 11 and 12. What did he, what, what's his testimony? He has given us eternal life. And his son, whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have God's son does not have life. That's God's testimony about his son. That's what it says in scripture. Um, how about this, uh, Hebrews chapter 1. Let me see if, uh, if, if any of you have ever heard this uh, about you. He says, uh, uh, God says this about his son. And when he brought his firstborn son, Jesus, when Jesus, uh, firstborn doesn't mean he was born at all. Firstborn is um, a special place of privilege in a family, right? Now, Israel is not the first nation that was ever been Born, but they're called the firstborn nation, right? And Jesus Christ is not born at all. But when he, when he came down from heaven to this earth, this is what God the Father said. Let all of God's angels worship him. But to the Son, he also says, your thro the, the Father says of his Son, Your throne, O God, endures forever and ever. You rule with a scepter of justice. You love, ju you love justice and hate evil. Therefore, O oh God, this is the father talking to his son, calling him God. Therefore, O oh God, your God has anointed you, pouring out the oil of joy on you more than anyone else. He also says to the son, in the beginning, Lord, he calls him God and Lord. He said, you laid the foundation of the earth. The father said that of the son. You laid the foundation of the earth and made the heavens with your hands. They will perish, but you remain forever. They will wear out like old clothing. You will fold them up like a cloak and discard them like old clothing. But you are always the same, and you will live forever. The book of Colossians, my favorite book in all of the Bible. At the beginning in Colossians chapter 1, I want to read this to you if I could get to it. In the beginning of Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 15, this is what God's word says of Christ, that Christ is the visible image of the invisible God, that he existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, Jesus Christ, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything, it's my favorite verse in all scripture. Everything was created through him and for him. 
He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who will rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. That's who Jesus Christ is. And loved ones... Hold on to that and never, ever let that go. This is the truth of who Jesus Christ is, okay? Never let it go and never get tired of hearing it. And we're prone to forget these things. And so it needs to be preached over and over and over again. Now, he says here in the text, he goes, uh, he kind of goes from less to greater. He says, uh, Well, since we believe in human testimony, kind of makes another assumption there, too. And he's right, uh, uh, human testimony, an eyewitness account is the strongest proof in the court of law, as we all know. Like, if someone is is a witness, that's the strongest testimony. Well, that's in the court of law secular, but how about biblically, which is where we get our greatest foundation, our truth, Deuteronomy 19 15 says something quite like it. It says that a single witness isn't sufficient, even. Only on the evidence of two or three witnesses shall a charge be established. So if you're going to accuse someone of something good or bad, you need to have at least two or three witnesses, right? And then Jesus Christ in Matthew 18, 16, and then Paul, again, in 2 Corinthians 13, 1, they repeat the same exact thing they say every charge must be established by two or three witnesses so here's what god does through john he says if you listen to tom dick and harry about this insignificant nothing well then surely you can listen to say i don't know the sovereign king of the universe maybe Kind of goes from less to big, right? I mean, if, we'll, if you'll listen to, 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 to Nancy, Eric, and Don, and, and there's three witnesses, and the Bible says if there's three witnesses to something, then we can establish a charge. Like this, okay, that's legit. Like if you listen to them, which are nothing, but we will, won't you listen to the testimony of God, the creator of heaven and earth? Won't you listen to the, to the blood? Won't you listen to the water? Won't you listen to the spirit? Won't you listen to the father who spoke audibly and we all heard it, that that's my son? Won't you listen to that? First John is a book of warning. And here's a very serious warning here in the text. Never lose sight of who Jesus Christ is. Never. And this is a warning that that you need to hear. Because like as the scripture says, just as you accepted him as Lord. Like there was a day, right? If you remember the day I saw a smile come right on your face when you thought of the day. When you said, Jesus, I'm yours. That was a good day, right? Do you guys remember that day? You remember that day? I remember that day. If you didn't remember that day, maybe you didn't have that day yet. Maybe today's that day. But just as you accepted Christ, so you must continue to walk in him, right? So that's just to be this remaining, abiding thing. We have to remind ourselves all the time of who Jesus Christ really is. He's the eternal son of God who existed before anything was created. God created all things through him and for him. So he is Lord of all. But is he your Lord? Do you hear his voice and follow him? Now listen, don't just say yes. Now look at your life. If there's anything in this church, like we're serious about making disciples of Jesus. You know what a disciple is? Wherever Jesus goes, that's where you go. When he thinks, that's how you think. When he speaks, you speak like that. Where he goes, you go. You, You copycat him. That's what you do. That's what a disciple of Jesus does. So is he really your Lord?
You know you love him if you keep his commands. He's not into this. He's into do. Okay? Do you follow him? But Jesus is also not just Lord, but he's the Christ. He's the anointed one. He's the Messiah. He's the one whose blood and death paid for your forgiveness. He's the narrow gate that everyone must go through to have access to God and to heaven. And we must not let any man, not any new progressive philosophy or any church ever, ever teach you something contrary to what I just said. Ever. He is God. He is Lord and He is Messiah. And He is not one or the other. He's both. And you can't have one without the other. If He's not your Lord, then He hasn't saved you. And if He saved you, then He's your Lord and you can't pick and choose which one you want. He's both. You saw it there in verses 11 and 12 as we close up now. It's short for me, but I said all I believe that God wants me to say. He says, and this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life, and, his life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. And he goes on to say, I've written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Chapter 2 says, I've written these things to you who are children of God because your sins have been forgiven by Jesus. Because you know Christ. And what did we learn before? We, to know Him is to what? To love Him. To love Him means to obey Him. To obey Him means to love all of His church. He says, I've written these things to you, believe, who are children of God because your sins have been forgiven by Jesus, because you know Christ, because you've won your battle with the evil one. This letter is written to saved people. So just as you first came and believed and followed, now remain. Now continue. Don't go back. Don't go left. Don't go right. Abide in Christ. Keep obeying his word. Keep loving his people, his church. Remain faithful to what you've been taught. And if you do, 1 John says, if you do, you will remain in fellowship with the Father and in the Son. And in this fellowship, you will enjoy the eternal life he has promised you. Father, we are so prone to wander from the God that we love. Lord, when we, when we wander, that doesn't mean we don't feel love for you. It just means that we've allowed other things to capture our attention, to distract us from our first love. Lord, we, we thank you for 1 John, for it is a stern reminder that things get in the way of our loving pursuit of you. And we want to be a people who pursue you with our whole heart. Because you are a rewarder of those who earnestly seek you. And that's the type of people we choose to be. So Lord, let the sudden and momentous shift in the status quo of this church and of this community be that we no longer settle for lethargy or complacency in our pursuit of you, but we pursue you with our whole heart that we might find you, that we might abide in you, that we might remain in you and produce much fruit for you for this kingdom of yours that you've been so gracious to allow us to even be a part of. So we thank you for the opportunity to be a part of your family. Lead us in the way that we should go. Now, loved ones, as we do every week, I, we're going we're gonna to receive an offering. It's part of what we do. 
Some people like it, some people don't. But listen, if you don't do it the way the Bible would say to do it, you're not going to like it. I tried that. Don't just, don't run. Don't, don't rip into your pocket and grab whatever's there. Whatever, you know, what do I need for twisty treat later? So I don't know, I'll give you this and then take the rest home. Like, don't do that. Don't do habit. Don't, don't, don't do what grandma told you. Listen, I, you might not agree with me. Don't tithe. The Bible says to pray about everything. Don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. Right? Thank God for what he's done. Tell him what you need. And the peace that surpasses all understanding would cover your heart and mind as you live in Christ. So giving becomes a joy. And it becomes something that the Holy Spirit has led you to do. So when these guys come through with the basket, we're not going to let them come through the room yet until you've prayed. Just take a few moments. Turn these lights down a little bit so no one can see anybody. I don't want anyone to see what you give or what you don't give. Just talk to the Lord. Ask him how you should give of the resources that he's given you to advance his kingdom so that other people could experience what you have in Christ. Father, we're listening.